body of the patient so both the definitions tells us that it's a non progressive injury to the brain and the motor dysfunction changes with time as the child grow now these are the few classifications one is the clinical classification based on the site of lesion so cerebral palsy can be spastic if the lesion is mainly in the cortex or the pyramidal tracts it can be dyskinetic if the lesion is in the extra pyramidal tract and dyskinetic can be athetosis uh, or uh, uh, chorea then it can be in the cerebellum leading to hypotonia or ataxic cerebral palsy and if it's a diffuse lesion it can show mixed picture another classification is known as a geographical or anatomical classification based on the uh, part of the body involved it can be monoplegia monoplegia is quite rare where only one extremity is involved and it is usually the lower extremity it can be hemiplegia where one side of the body is involved and here the upper extremity is involved more than the lower extremity it can be paraplegia where both lower limbs are equally involved it can be diaplegic where lower extremities and upper extremities both are involved but lower extremities are involved more than the upper it can be quadriplegic where all the four extremities are equally involved but there is normal head neck and trunk control head and neck control sorry it can be double hemiplegia where all extremities are involved and upper extremities are involved more than the lower and it can be a total body involvement where even the head and neck control is not present and there is a functional classification based on the function of the child these are a uh, seven functional classifications but the most common ones used are gross motor functional classification system or the gm fcs and the functional mobility scale or the fms so gm fcs was given by robert pelisano et al in 1997 and it is mainly used to classify kids from 2 to 18 years of age here the emphasis is on function in sitting and walking and the distinctions between levels is focused on functional limitations and the need for assistive devices like walker crutches or canes and whether there is a need of wheeled mobility or not so here we have uh, they have classified uh, kids into five levels gm fcs 1 where the child can walk independently at home school outdoors and community can climb stairs without using railings and can perform gross motor skills like running and jumping but the speed balance and coordination are limited then gm fcs 2 here the child can walk in most settings but he needs to hold a railing while climbing stairs he has difficulty in walking long distances and uses physical assistance or mobility devices for long distances and he has minimal ability to perform gross motor skills like running and jumping gmfcs 3 where the child walks using handheld mobility devices in most indoor settings like a walker or a cane child climbs up stair holding railing and with some supervision or physical assistance he uses wheeled mobility for long distances gmfcs 4 where the child uses physical assistance in almost all regions or a powered mobility he may walk for short distances at home with physical assistance or a body support walker and uses manual wheelchair or powered mobility in school and community and finally gmfcs 5 where the child is transported in manual wheelchair in all settings and he has there is limited in their they are limited in their ability to maintain anti gravity head and trunk postures so their head and neck control is also absent so this was gmfcs then there is functional mobility scale which was given by royal children's hospital in 2004 and it's 
a bit more uh, zoom in in the function assessment it is used in children between age 4 to 18 and it takes into account different assistive devices a child uses in different environments so gaurav now if if i stop you for a moment now right. what is the importance of gmfcs you know Uh, G- G- GMF before the advent of GMFCS, uh, like we were not able to define the outcomes. How GMFCS helps us in uh, explaining or parental uh, communication? Please explain that. Yes, sir. So GMFCS is very important in having a common language among different among different physicians and uh, physiotherapists, so they can commute well. communicate well that we have a gmfcs 3 child so that helps in understanding the function another thing is there are different treatment and management goals in different gmfcs level so gmfcs 1 2 3 are ambulatory and 4 and 5 are non ambulatory so the management goals are different in ambulatory kids and non ambulatory kids in non ambulatory kids we are just trying to Uh, help the caregiver to manage them well whereas in ambulatory kids we can help in improving their ambulation improving their function right so goal of treatment is different uh, in uh, ambulatory and non ambulatory children and gmfcs 4 and 5 what are the common goal for non ambulatory children so mainly for non ambulatory kids we want that they should not become more pain, painful like they are, they have more chances of hip subluxations and dislocations so we don't want them to be more pain, painful by getting those things so we can do adductor releases then uh, we can uh, another goal is to maintain their hygiene so if they have adduction contractures taking care of their hygiene is very difficult so so those are the goals and to make the parents comfortable or the caregiver comfortable in handling them so so the key thing is there are three goals when we see a child in gmfcs 4 or 5 the goal is not to make them independent ambulator the goal is to prevent hip dislocation the second goal is to prevent scoliosis to happen because about 50% children develop scoliosis and then it is followed by respiratory distress and then that leads to terminal event and the third is bone health bone health of this patients are very poor so we have to make them stand upright in the in a standing frame even though they are non ambulant with the help of uh, straps because in upright posture their bones are loaded and so the calcium will be driven within the bone so their bones will be fine because there are ample of patients we see neglected gmfcs 5s they have very uh, severe fractures with trivial trauma so these three goals are there uh, and this we can discuss with family if a child gmfcs 4 comes at the age of 15 and they have expectations that by surgeries you can make them independent ambulator so we have to tell them at the outset that that is not the goal of treatment and again in ambulatory cerebral palsy we have different goals like we want to make their gait energy efficient we want to improve their stability uh, and we want to increase their endurance so there we can uh, talk and there the role of F- fms comes right. fms is you will explain that it's a quantification of improvement so let's uh, know from gaurav please tell us about functional mobility scale yeah so functional mobility scale is used in kids 4 to 18 years of age it takes into account different assistive devices a child uses in different environments and it basically rates walking ability at 5 50 and 500 meters representing child's mobility in home school and community setting this assessment is made on the basis of questions asked from the child or the parent and these are the questions how does your child move around for short distances in the house to represent 5 meters of walk how does your child move around in and between classes at school to represent 50 meters 
and how does your child move around for long distances such as at the shopping center to represent 500 meters walk so this is rated uh, graded into 6 grades grade 6 is equivalent to gmfcs 1 where the child is independent and can walk on all surfaces does not use any walking aid or need any help from another person when walking over all surfaces including uneven grounds curbs etc and in a crowded environment grade 5 where the child is independent on level surfaces it does not use walking aids or need help from another person but he may require a rail for stairs if the child uses furniture walls fences or shop fronts or some kind of support then we have to grade him into grade 4 Grade four is where the child uses stick, either one or two stick, but he does not need help from any other person. Grade three is when the child uses crutches, no help from any other person. Grade two is where the child uses walker, but no other physical assistance, and grade one, where the child uses wheelchair. he may stand for transfers may do some stepping supported by another person or using a walker or frame then there are two other grades grade c where the child cannot walk and crawls for mobility even at home and grade n where the child is not able to complete the task so these grades we have to grade the child in all the three areas at 5 meter 50 meter and 500 meters so this is a functional mobility scale and this helps in assessing the improvement post surgery we can't have shift in gmfcs scales but we do see shifts in fms scale after surgery and physiotherapies so there are many centers you know where they uh... give this form to family before the surgery the key thing is the family can themselves fill this form up and they can rate their child and the same form is uh, given once they come at 3 months follow up or 6 months follow up so it's a quantification of improvement as you rightly say that we cannot expect a uh, jump in gmfcs If if the child is undergoing regular therapy or the child is doing ev everything by his own potential, the full potential, sometimes we see that children have not received physiotherapy for long, and then we they are uh, they are um, non-ambulant and after surgery they they become ambulant. But that does not mean that uh, the child child has jumped the GMFCS. Actually, the child was not working at his full potential. That that is the explanation. so uh, for young uh, even physiotherapist you can download this form and you can give it to family before you start the therapy session and then you can see your outcome after 3 months 6 months and uh, that will give a clue to family themselves because all the parents they want to know the number you know we we want to know how our children perform in their school exam same way the families they are very excited to see the numbers at the same time they are uh, quite stimulated for the child's uh, better performance right so any any question so far about this then we can discuss we do not have any cases so we have some time today for discussion during the talk if you have any question put in chat box and uh, this is about definition and classification i think now we'll head to the examination if we right. don't have any question dr tejas patel is here very senior an experienced neurodevelopmental therapist from ahmedabad tejas do you use this uh, uh, gmfcs and fms in your practice yes we quietly commonly use this gmfcs mm mm-hmm. mhm Uh, in our common uh, in our common practice uh, especially you know discussing with the uh, fellow colleagues and uh, orthopedic surgeons and uh, if we'll talk about the 
old child uh, status so we'll start with the uh, case GMFC. That, yeah it's a spastic diaplegia gmfcs3 something that so the fellow colleague will be having the idea that what is the exact for the functional of... level the child that's very good yeah fine so even fms is also uh, they just you should uh, use in your practice and that will you know many a times we rely on what parents say you know? and parents opinion is quite they are overwhelmed by the therapist sometimes so we may not be able to know the real improvement but this kind of skill can help you okay let let's move ahead with uh, the examination part so let us start with examination so today we will be talking about the static physical examination St uh, this physical examination basically includes the orthopedic assessment we are not talking about the neurological examination here in an ambulatory child we assess the muscle length muscle tone selective motor control joints lever arm assessment so muscle length to assess the muscle length we range the joint we move the joint slowly and see whether the joint has equal movement as compared to the opposite joint or not then if there is some uh, tightness or if there is some limitation then we try to see whether it's a dynamic contracture or a static contracture so then we assess the muscle tone so muscle tone is basically resistance to passive stretch during the resting state of a muscle a muscle can be of normal tone hypotonic or hypertonic in upper motor neuron lesions like cerebral palsy there is basically hypertonia commonly and in can and it can present either as spasticity or rigidity spasticity is a velocity dependent resistance to passive stretch and it changes with change in velocity whereas rigidity is velocity independent resistance to passive stretch now spasticity can be of clasp knife type wherein there is increase in resistance only at the beginning or at the end of the movement the way a clasp knife opens and rigidity can be as it is velocity independent there is a continuous increase in resistance like a lead pipe bending of a lead pipe or it can be a cogwheel type where there is an on and off change in resistance to passive movement in a jerky manner like moving a cogwheel so we can measure these spasticity by various scales one of those is modified ashworth scale where we grade yeah, now this... gorav if i ask how it is spasticity or rigidity uh makes difference in your treatment can you uh, tell that now a child is having a rigidity or contracture and a child is having a dynamic spasticity so how it would uh, affect your management so if the child has spasticity which is dynamic then then my treatment i mean then it can be managed with uh some kind of a physiotherapy or uh, or botulinum toxin it may not need a surgery all the time but if it is a if it is a rigid contracture where there is no play then most of the times it needs some kind of a soft tissue release or if it is very rigid then it may need a bony surgery also so that's very important point you know uh, and then we all must understand all the beginners and even therapists that botox does not work on a short muscle and and botox work on those muscles which are tight but it is stretchable so if you refer a child who has and most of our children have a combination of dynamic uh, spasticity as well as a bit of contracture and for those certain degrees of contracture we use plaster cast but when it is purely contracture then botox we cannot blame botox that uh, botox does 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 not work here but we have to selectively choose our patients now our next uh, fellow module is on botulinum use in cerebral palsy so 
So Dr. Ratna will tell us more in details about it. But uh, we have to very uh, precisely choose. And now there are papers are coming that we should not use Botox very frequently, very high dose. Now that again, that will be talked uh, in the next session. But one must be able to identify what is the component of dynamic spasticity and what is the component of contracture, which I think Gaurav will tell us about in Ashworth and Tardew. Right, right sir. Right, sir. Yeah. So, Gaurav, I'm just not disturbing you. I'm trying to bring out yes, practical sir. points so that it would benefit to all. You know? Yes, sir. That's very important. Please, please keep raising them, sir. Thank you. So, so modified Ashworth scale is where we grade the muscle tone from zero to four in zero, there is no increase in tone or it's a normal muscle grade one. There is slight increase in to uh, tone and there is a catch or a release only at the end of the, uh, or the terminal range only one plus where there is a catch or release in half of the range grade two in most of the range grade three, where there is a very high tone, we are, but we are able to move the joint and grade four, where we are absolutely unable to move the joint. So we can grade the tone on the basis of this scale, or there's another scale, which is more practical is known as a modified tardew scale, where we try to move the joint initially in a fast passive motion and the first catch we measure the angle at the first catch. It is known as R1. Then we slowly move the joint further and to the maximum passive motion. And that angle is known as R2. So R1 initially in a fast motion, the angle is measured in R2 in a slow passive motion to range the joint maximally. And that angle is measured. Now, if there is a difference in R1 and R2, that tells us that this has got a dynamic spasticity and here, as sir said, we can use measures like physiotherapy and Botox, but if R1 and R2 are almost equal and there is no difference that tells that the muscle has got a muscle is short with a static contracture and we have to do some kind of a release for this muscle. So any questions on this or we can move ahead. One thing is, uh, which is worth noticing that when the, there is already in plano valgoid foot, you know, in the equinus contracture of some extent, it becomes difficult to assess to uh, this R1 and R2 because the foot is deformed. First, you have to invert the foot and uh, to make the ankle neutral and then you can check, but it sometimes becomes difficult. The rest, we can use this Tardew scale at all the levels like hip adductors, even rectus, uh, hamstrings we use. So modified Tardew scale uh, is what we use frequently. Uh, yes, that, Amitosh, no, right. what uh, do you use uh, modified Tardew or you use um, this Mod Ashworth? Kindly unmute yourself and tell. Or Chati, what is your practice? Chinma, you, you have been in uh, this uh, San Diego CP unit. What do they use for this? Uh, they use our tradu skills, a modified tradu skill, most mm -hmm. commonly. Yes, sir. Do you, you have spent time here? Is there anything different in clinical exam? Uh, the specificity no, or the same they use? No, no, the same thing, sir. Nothing extra okay. they do. Right. Fine. Gaurav, go ahead. Yeah. So then we assess the selective motor control, which is the ability to perform isolated movements on request with appropriate timing and voluntary control. Usually these kids don't have a good selective motor control. And when asked to do one particular movement, all their muscles start acting and they are not able to do it isolatedly. On the basis of that, we can grade whether the child is absolutely not able to do it or there is some partial ability or he is completely able to do it. 
and these are the scales which we can use to test the selective motor control for lower extremity it is known as scale where we include five reciprocal lower extremity movements like hip flexion extension knee flexion extension ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion subtalar inversion and eversion and toe flexion and extension and on the basis of the child's ability we can grow, grade it at 0 1 and 2 for upper extremity we can grade it as shoulder abduction adduction elbow flexion extension forearm pronation supination wrist flexion extension and finger grasp and release and we can grade it similarly we can also do a confusion test where we ask the child to flex his hip and we resist the hip flexion and if that causes movement of tibialis anterior muscle uh, to to cause ankle dorsiflexion so that is also suggesting that the control is not very good and there is tibialis anterior tightness also what is the importance of selective motor control as far as the outcome is concerned gaurav sir for out as far as the outcome is concerned if the selective motor control is good then the outcome will be good because then the child then the specific muscle released will act better when when the surgery is done but if the child has got a poor selective motor control then then the result will not be very good because the child is not able to differentiate which muscle to use also if the child has got a good selective motor control then tendon transfers will work better mm-hmm. otherwise we have to do releases rely mm-hmm. more on releases so tejas are you there with us So Tejas, what you have observed in uh, operated patients who have very good selective motor control and those who have poor selective motor control, what are the problems in therapy and rehab? You see. So, uh, of course, as uh, Dr. Gaurav has explained, that uh, the better selective motor control, the better outcome it is. Uh, the children who are having the poor uh, selective control, they have a problems in uh, dissociating the movements uh, uh, especially uh, hip flexion extension abduction adduction so when we ask them to move any single limb or dissociate uh, the inter or intra limb movement so they coactivate everything together the child who has a poor uh, selective control so that uh, that hampers a uh, so because of that they use lot of energy and uh, uh, it will be difficult for them to move so this is how the therapy is you know uh, uh, getting up a challenging yeah so that's yeah. what i have observed you know and i always talk to family that this child is not able to isolate movement he does everything together so the rehab and strengthening of those isolated group of muscle is difficult and sir, the outcomes are relatively uh, compromised yeah sir, someone add, sir can i add something mona here ha ah, please yes mona so uh, sir uh, many times what we have seen is that uh, uh, more than a select, the selective motor control also many times uh, depends a lot on the course control so what level of postural uh, systems and postural stability they have so many time what they just said that uh, this uh, uh, lack of dissociation in lower extremity uh, is directly related to the amount of core or postural control they have if their postural and central stability is good then we see that they able to isolate lower extremities better uh, especially at the hip uh, but uh, uh, many times the uh, stiff knee for example using uh, rely uh, uh, rely too much on uh, the knee where we see lot of coactivation of rectus and hamstring and they have inability to move the knee joint uh, difficulty either side they are fixed into that range where they activate around knee so much for stability because they don't have core stability so especially for the uh, good selective motor control in the proximal leg joints like hip and knee uh, i have seen it that it uh, the reflection is more from lesser postural control mm-hmm. uh, but when it goes to distal yeah then we see it as a brain damage so 
definitely uh, with a very good core also, I see that they have very poor selective motor control of dorsiflexors and versus, so uh, for dorsiflexion, I see that that exists in itself, but for hip and knee, majorly I feel because of the poor postural control, they use their uh, proximal long muscles uh, to, they use tonically to stabilize. And that's where uh, mm -hmm. they develop a lot of co-activation in the muscles around hip and knee. And that's why they have poor selective motor. So the question is like, when we say, for instance, some child does not have very good trunk and pelvic dissociation, and they have spasticity and then we want to treat them. Do you recommend yes. to do work on core to improve selective motor control first before we perform surgery? That's one. And how much time it takes? Many a times this select, it is, I have seen it's very difficult to develop a selective motor control. So can we wait? So let's take this question later, Mona. Okay. Uh, let Gaurav continue. But uh, the key thing is, Selective motor control assessment by pediatric orthopedicians are very important to forecast that did rehab, how challenging the rehab would be. Yeah, Gaurav, go ahead. Then, then we assess the core strength and we do it by doing a high kneeling where the child is kneeling on his knees and is able to stand on his knees without any support for more than 30 seconds. And we grade it if the child is able to initiate it or is able to do it less than 10%, is able to do partially, or is able to do it completely. The better the core strength, more the possibility that child may be able to walk independent post-surgery and physiotherapy. After this, we assess the uh, specific joints. So for hip flexors or the iliopsoas muscle, we do the Thomas test where one hip and knee is flexed to stabilize the pelvis and then the the hip range the the angle of the hip flexion is measured from the couch and that tells us how much hip flexion contracture the child has so we have to obliterate the lumbar lordosis very important so opposite or the contralateral hip is flexed and then the child is asked to straight the the affected leg and then the angle should be measured. Then hip adductors are assessed both in hip flexion and uh, both in hip abduction, uh, sorry, both in knee flexion and knee extension. When the hips and knees are flexed and abduction is assessed, then we are basically assessing the adductors, adductor longus brevis and magnus tightness because the medial hamstrings and gracilis is relaxed at that point. And when the hips are abducted in hip and knee extension, at that time, we are basically assessing the gracilis and medial hamstring tightness. This is also known as FLEPS test. Then we see the rectus femoris tightness. It's known as Duncan Ellis test or Ellis test, where the child is made to lie prone. One leg is extended and the opposite knee is flexed. Initially, we bring the leg into flexion swiftly or fast and that demonstrates the spasticity of the rectus femoris and then gradually we bring it into flexion and that demonstrates the tightness of the rectus femoris and we can grade it from 0 to 2 depending upon how early the hip flexes. If it flexes in less than half the range, we grade it, one, uh, grade it 2 and if it flexes after half the range of knee flexion, we grade it 1. And if it does not flex, we grade it 0. Then we assess the torsional profile of uh, the femur. And we see a lot of kids walking with internal rotation gait, leading to a poor abductor lever arm and an energy uh, inefficient gait. So to assess femoral antiversion, we know that femoral antiversion is the angle between the femoral neck and the transfemoral condylar axis. And clinically, we measure it by making the child prone. So these are the photographs showing the 
increased femoral antiversion leading to increased internal rotation and decreased external rotation and this femoral antiversion can be measured by making the child prone and internally rotating the femur simultaneously assessing the greater trochanter and when it becomes the most prominent or becomes parallel to the couch that is the point where we measure the angle as shown in this photograph this is also known as craig's test then after assessing the hip we can assess the we should assess the knee where we are mainly assessing the hamstring length so we can do straight leg rest straight leg raise test we can ask the child to sit on the couch at the corner of the um, of the bed and then ask the child to extend the knee the child should not be bending backwards and the, and his spine should be straight and the lag from neutral is known as the extensor lag and it suggests either hamstring tightness or quadriceps weakness in both them both of them the there can be extensor lag then we should check the knee extension by asking the child to lie supine and extending his hip and knee and the lag between the knee and the couch can tell us the contracture of the knee or and it can be due to posterior capsular tightness also then to assess the hamstring contracture we check the popliteal angle where we make the child to lie supine we extend the hip and the knee of the contralateral side and we flex the hip and the knee of the same side then we try to extend the knee and we measure the angle from the vertical that tells us the functional hamstring contracture and normally also less than 6 years kid can have 0 to 30 degrees of uh, popliteal angle 7 to 12 years 15 to 40 and more than 13 to i mean 13 to 18 years can have 20 to 50 degrees of popliteal angle now this tells us functional hamstring contracture then we ask the patient to flex the hip and knee of the opposite side to square the pelvis to obliterate the lumbar lordosis and then we measure this angle again if there is a shift of more than 20 degrees uh, so so this this is known as hamstring shift the change in the popliteal angle after flexing the opposite hip and knee is known as hamstring shift and if this shift is more than 20 degrees it indicates that it was mainly due to excessive anterior pelvic tilt and the cause can be tight hip flexors weak abdominals and weak hip extensors in presence of increased lordosis there can be apparent hamstring contracture or ham, uh, apparent hamstring contracture with normal hamstring length and in those cases uh, hamstring release will not work rather we should work on hip flexors weak abdominals and weak hip extensors there is one more angle which is known as popliteal shift where we are checking the r1 and r2 as uh, as suggested in tardieu scale and this change can tell us whether we should release the hamstrings or use botox so popliteal shift is different from hamstring shift then we assess the foot and we can have foot uh, we can have equinus equino varus equino valgus hallux valgus and tibial torsion so one of the most important tests to assess the dorsiflexion of angle is no uh, ankle is known as silver shield test so we ask the child to flex the hip of the affected side flex the hip and knee of the affected side and then in slight inversion of the foot we dorsiflex the ankle and we measure the angle and then we do we also measure the angle in knee extension and on the basis of that we assess whether there is tightness of isolated gastrocnemius or both so if the angle if the angle is better or dorsiflexion is more in knee flexion 
but less in knee extension, then it suggests that there is gastrocnemius tightness. Whereas if the if the uh, angle is same, dorsiflexion is same in both knee extension and flexion, but it is less than the opposite side, then it suggests that there is tightness of both soleus and gastrocnemius. So an uh, important point as suggested by Sir is that it should be done in slight inversion and not in eversion. Then we assess the torsional profile and for this we make the child prone and we flex the knees to 90 degrees. We measure the bimalleolar axis by a line bisecting both the malleoli and we measure the thigh axis and the angle between them is known as thigh foot axis. Normally it can be between minus 30 to plus 20 in infants or between minus 5 to plus 30 in children with more than 8 years of age. So on the basis of these measurements we can see whether this, this is increased or not. Then for foot we can see we can assess hind foot varus or valgus by assessing the tibialis posterior or anterior tightness which both can lead to hind foot varus and spastic peroneae or tight gastrocnemius which can lead to hind foot valgus. Supinated foot which can be mainly due to tibialis anterior tightness and we can assess hallux valgus which is common in several palsy patients. For upper limb we can assess shoulder internal rotation mainly the internal rotators contract then forearm pronator because of pronator tightness elbow flexion deformity wrist flexion deformity thumb in palm deformity and finger flexion deformity so we should assess all these contractures and treat accordingly in spine we should assess about uh, regarding scoliosis kyphos kyphosis and lordoscoliosis so this is in brief the static physical examination which we do obviously we need gait assessment then we should objectify our findings with x-rays or ct scans 3d gait analysis and then plan our treatment so thank you sir and this is open yeah. for discussion now yeah so um i thought that you would have some uh, gait videos also to show that's fine if, if it's not there but uh, the clinical practice is usually when we see a child with hemiplegia or diplegia, we make them walk in our consulting room and try to define them what sort of uh, gait pattern the child has. Now, there is a defined gait pattern in diplegia as well as in uh, hemiplegia. And can someone summarize the types of gait? Shalin, uh, you remember? hemiplegic gait patterns or a diplegic gait patterns? Are you there? Or anyone like uh, Ankit or uh, who would like to take hemiplegic? What common hemiplegic gait patterns we see? Abhilash? Abhishek? Jab answer karna hai, sab ho jate hai. Hi, sir. So, uh, for, so for yeah. we see a true equinus. Yes. According to the Roda gate classification, first the true equinus, then the jumping gate. Right. The equinus, and then the crouch gate. Uh, and right. So, gate. each, uh, can you tell which muscles are likely to be involved in each type of gate? What, what is there in true equinus? So for true equinus, the gastronemius is the one which is mainly tight. For jump knee gait, that is, uh, along with gastronemius tightness, there is either hamstring or rectus femoris tightness, which is present. Your apparent equinus, gastronemius is tight along with uh, hamstring, and sometimes along with psoas is also tight. And... Uh, for crouch gait, the hamstrings are the one which are mainly tight and uh, the gastronemius tightness has been converted to a plain valgoid fit. Right. So, when we are seeing your equinus gait in spastic diplegia, we see mostly gastro gastronemius tightness. But in hemiplegic, we see gastroxoleus or a tendoachillus contracture most of the times. 
for apparent equinus, many a times it is due to significant hamstring spasticity, that uh, gastroxole is of, uh, of normal length and there is not much spasticity, but due to knee FFD at times, child tends to walk with heel off. So whenever you see equinus, there are different patterns. There's a true equinus, then comes the apparent equinus, then comes hidden equinus. Sometimes children who develop early midfoot break or plano valgoid, you will see that the heel is down, but uh, the still TA is tight. Or sometimes they put the heel down without plano valgoid, but they lock their knees. So always make a habit to check the child with uh, the clothes bit off. You must be able to see the knee joint when they walk because otherwise you may miss the locking of knee in a clinical sign of equinus, I mean the TA tightness. And then comes jump knee pattern where hamstring and TA both are tight. And crouch, we all know that crouch, the hamstrings, our uh, main culprit most of the times, TA is st uh, stretchable. On the contrary, they are overstretched at, at some point. Some crouch, you have to define, there are different types of crouch as well. The crouch can be because of tight, tight hamstrings, crouch maybe because of weak quadriceps. Sometimes we, we do not see tightness in hamstring, but the quadriceps are weak and there might be some proximal reasons. So usually the practice is once we see the child walking, then we assume that this type of gait pattern it is and we know which muscles are likely to be involved. And then you take the child on crouch uh, and check your uh, uh, muscle spasticity. And of course, torsional profile because in, in uh, diplegics, not only muscle uh, lengthenings or muscle transfers, but you also have to correct the lever arm. Right, so there is a question from Ankit that what angle, what is the range of silver skewer test or change in R1 and R2? So for TA uh, to differentiate whether it is, uh, you got you want to answer why, what you, what you do, whether you do silver skewer or you see R1, R2. I think this both are different things. Gaurav can answer this. Yes, so R1, R2 is basically the change in ankle dorsiflexion. So I check R1, R2 in knee extension. I check with slight inversion. I check the ankle dorsiflexion by a fast movement first. And the first catch is R1. And then gradually with slow, slowly, I maximally dorsiflex and that is R2. And shift in R1 and R2 tells me that how much dynamic contracture is there. So on the basis of that, I plan my treatment, whether I need to do a release or need to do Botox. Whereas silver shield test, we are checking the ankle dorsiflexion in knee flexion and knee extension. And the difference in ankle dorsiflexion tells us whether there is only gastrocnemius tightness or there is a combination of both soleus and gastrocnemius tightness. Usually our aim is to have more than 15 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion at knee extension to have a normal gait. Right. So now it is also important to remember that uh, many times the static as well as the, uh, the visual video gate analysis or just visual analysis may have delusion, you know, or, or sometimes we may miss the things uh, and we may miss which muscles are firing during different phases of gait. So the step ahead would be to combine our clinical examination to a computerized gait analysis. This month we have the CP module and uh, Dr. Chasnell at the end of the uh, module, she is going to talk about uh, visual gait analysis. Along with Jayant and Taral, they are uh, doing monthly gait analysis sessions. So those who are interested to learn gait analysis can attend those sessions. And this, they, uh, but VAR management is not purely dependent on gait analysis. We have to check each and everything of the what uh, Gaurav mentioned about static exam, dynamic uh, exam, gait patterns, selective control, strength of muscles. These all factors are important in making correct decision about surgery. Right? And 
of course the communication with family is very important so we should communicate with them with gmfcs and fms to uh, have the objective uh, finding of the outcome fine so if you have, if we have any question then we can answer or now we we'll quickly go through the quiz for fellows and uh, i'll invite shinam to run the quiz so although i uh, i created the poll so it's not working at this point so all the pediatric orthopedic fellows please write down your answer in a sheet and you can send this uh, to shalin uh, shalin is asking what about dystonia gorov can you would you like to answer how to diagnose a dystonia what is the definition of dystonia and how so, it affects the outcome so dystonia is abnormal tone it is neither hyper or hypo it can be a mix of both and those patients when we range the joints we can we can understand we can assess dystonia because the range changes uh, the the tone changes and those are not very good patients for surgical surgeries and we should avoid doing surgeries in them and we should basically rely on physio for them so shalin you know that that uh, these spasticity children or contracted uh, children they have when they are asleep or when they are relaxed still they have those uh, shortening of muscle but the dystonia family when you ask to the mother that say wo jab raat ko jab soya hota hai to it ekdam relax hota hai so dystonia is uh, the change in the tone based on the excitement of child and those patients uh, they are not very good candidates because the outcome of either botox or surgery are not reliable and dystonia is said that that would persist in the body if it goes from one area it may shift to the other area and uh, we have seen children where we have treated at ex lower extremity they they started to have oral dystonia or upper extremity dystonia so there are some medications uh, it's um, dopamine or this uh, sindopa this neurologists are doing sometimes they have excellent control in certain types of dystonia but when there is a, a dystonic element in your clinical exam usually children in certain phase of gait they would uh, contract certain group of muscles and you will be able to recognize this is dystonia so be aware that you explain to the family that the outcome of dystonia with with orthopedic interventions are not very reliable yes shinam and shalin please take uh, all the fellows through the quiz you answer this questions give the answer sheet whatsapp it to uh, shinam or shalin and next week we will announce the winners and a nice gift will be on your way if you happen to win this contest okay yeah shinam share you uh, go ahead Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, first question is, uh, which blood vessel is at risk while doing posterior arthrotomy in children? A uh, lateral circumflex femoral artery, medial circumflex femoral artery, profunda femoris, or obturator? So the bar on your right side, you know, it's a, it's an animation showing ten uh, seconds, but you can take fifteen seconds. Okay. Next question yeah. is, uh, which of the following is not a feature of developmental coxa vera? Increased femoral antiversion, increased HE angle, short femoral neck, decreased femoral epiphyseal diaphyseal angle. If you have a difficult question, Dalai. So these questions are based on our previous module. So uh, I think Dr. Manoj Padman taught all of you about coxa vera. So based on your answers, I'm going to talk to different faculties. If you have not studied well, if you give wrong answer, yeah, go ahead, Shin. Okay, so next question is. 
Okay, next question is what degree of abduction in harness or hip spica is associated with femoral head avascular necrosis? Uh, first is more than 45, more than 50, more than 60, or more than 70. Dr. Ramani Narsimhan talked to you about uh, uh, treatment of DDH in infancy. And he mentioned this point. Okay, next question is, which is the structure pointed on ultrasound? Uh, we have hip capsule, rectus femoris, labrum, gluteus medius. So actually, Dr. Graf, I attended uh, Dr. Graf's course and he asked these questions to all the delegates. And I could answer this question rightly. And he gave me this Austrian pound or dollar, whatever, one coin he gave me. I still have that with me. Yeah, Sheenam, give a little bit of time. Yes. Next question is a picture showing arthrogram. This structure has been pointed in the image uh, with black arrow. Uh, first is pulvinar inverted limbus transverse estabular ligament and hip capsule. Next question is, uh, which stage of Elizabeth town classification this participant uh, is in? First stage 1B, 2A, 2B, and 3. Lateral pillar classification is evident how long after the onset of symptoms? One month, 12 months, three months, six months. Dr. Hitesh uh, took a talk about B6 in Perthes disease and he mentioned this in his talk. Next question, which procedure uh, is done in this nine years old presented with Perthes disease? First is carry osteotomy, pelvic estabular osteotomy, shelf procedure, or Degas estabuloplasty. Next question, uh, which is the most common complication of medial open reduction of developmental dysplasia of hip? First is coxa magna, coxa breva, coxa velga, coxa vera. Dr. Sally Lupasni from San Diego uh, discussed medial open reduction DDH. I think I should know this answer. Next question, uh, which is the likely diagnosis in a three months old infant on the basis of these x-rays? Uh, first is osteomyelitis, Kephes disease, ring sarcoma, and CRMO, that is multifocal osteomyelitis. Next question uh, is, which of the following joints is at the lowest risk for concurrent septic arthritis in the set setting of metaphyseal osteomyelitis? Options are shoulder joint, hip, elbow, or knee. Next question is, an 11 years old boy had septic arthritis shoulder thrombosis in subclavian vein and pulmonary septic embolism. 
what is the likely organism first is msa second uh, hamrsa camrsa or gram negative sepsis Our next is which feature of MRI suggests the need of surgical drainage, as shown in the picture. First is humeral metaphysis osteomyelitis. Second is subcutaneous ear. Third is Brody's abscess and subperiosteal abscess. So right, uh, so that makes uh, we finish the quiz here. Now, Shalin, you have to take us through the answers. Yeah, this is the last question. Sheena, go ahead. Calcaneal uh, osteomyelitis has high risk for which of the following as compared to hematogenous osteomyelitis? First is group A Staphylococcus, coliforms, hemophilus infection, or pseudomonas. Right, so these questions were based on our module so far. So can you play the slideshow again? And Shalin, can you answer those questions? We'll, or let's wait for some time and people should send their answers to you guys before we discuss. Yeah. Yes, uh, Shalin, you can discuss the answers of each question briefly. Yeah, Shalin, can you, uh, are you there with us? Yeah. So, question one, Shinam, can you bring the question one? Yes. Yeah. So, what's the answer of question one, Shalin? Shinam, would you like to take this answer? Yes, sir. Uh, which blood vessel is at risk while doing posterior arthrotomy in children? That is medial circumflex femoral artery. Yeah, so there's a very nice paper about anatomy of medial circumflex femoral artery and it, it scores along the posterior uh, capsule and is very vulnerable uh, where we are near the pyriformis. So, as in children, whenever there is septic arthritis, we should avoid posterior arthrotomy because that may invite AVN and one must go the anterior. So, MCFA is the correct answer. Yeah. This is a paper published in JBJS 2012, and we, I think, 2012, that, that everyone should read. Yeah. Go ahead. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, which of the following is not a feature of developmental coxa vera? Uh, the options are, uh, the answer is increased femoral antiversion. In the developmental coxa vera, we see decreased femoral antiversion, not increased. Exactly. So, in coxa vera, Dr. John Wedge from Sikkis used to say it's not a coronal plane deformity. It's actually a sagittal plane deformity. Many a times when you take an x-ray uh, with a corrected version of femur, like they are in retroversion most of the time and you correct, make, put them in antiversion and take an x-ray. You may find that coronal plane looks better or normal. So, coxa vera correction needs not only coronal plane correction, but also the sagittal plane correction. If Shalin is here. Shalin, please answer further questions. Take question three, Srinam. Yes, sir. Yeah, Shani, what, what should be the degrees which can lead to AVN? What do you think?
Yes, yeah, Shinam, what do you think? What okay. degree? Of... Uh, it, its answer is more than 60 degree. Yeah. So whenever it is more than 60 degree, then there is chance that we are, we might compress the uh, retinacular vessels and induce AVM. Yeah, so it should be always less than 60 degrees, either, either in harness or in uh, spike. Yeah, next one. Which is the structure pointed on ultrasound? That is hip capsule, rectus femoris, labrum, or gluteus medius. The answer uh, here is, I think uh, it's uh, labrum. Or, no, yes, no that is not no, it's not labrum. Yes. Chinna, uh, Shalin or Chinmay, can you tell me, Gaurav, what is that structure? Labrum is, uh, can you see my pointer? Uh, no, sir. Labrum is just beneath the, um, just above the head, which is light green color. That's not labrum. Gaurav, what it is? Gluteus. It's rectus femoris. So, yes, that is rectus, straight head of rectus femoris. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. And gluteus medius will come. Just above that would be gluteus minimus. Okay. okay. And labrum is below. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Picture showing arthrogram with structure has Okay. Been now, let, let others. Gaurav, what do you think it is? Is it uh, tal? I, I I think think so. Yeah, Shina, is it uh, yes, tan yes. transverse acetabular ligament? Yes, sir. It is transverse acetabular ligament. Just right. above it is pulvinar. Right, right. So transverse acetabular ligament is very important structure to cut. Now the next question is, when you cut the transverse acetabular ligament, would you cut on the medial side or on the lateral side? Uh, Dr. Yakub or uh, Vigneshwaran, Ankit, anyone can take this? Uh, I think on the lateral side. My fellows would know because I always tell them. I want to listen from others. Right, so we should do it from the lateral side because on the medial side, there is a branch of medial circumflex femoral is going and sometimes we may injure it iatrogenically and invite AVN. So, cut it on the lateral side. Yes. Yeah, next question. Uh, which stage of Elizabeth Town classification? Uh, Shalin, Shalin, now you have your audio. Yes, sir. Tell me what is Stage 3. Huh? Elizabeth. Stage 3 Elizabeth, there is reossification over the lateral side. With Either a reossification. Multiple, multiple fissures are there. More than two. So, stage 2B. Of mm -hmm. Fragmentation. Three may to healing shuru yes. stage two B. There are ah, more than two so, fissures of yeah. yeah. So this is late fragmentation, right? There are multiple fissures without evidence of woven bone on the lateral side. When we see woven bone, then it is early healing. The sclerosis of this lateral segment is the same as the central and medial segment. So I think this is two B. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Next question. Later pillar classification is evident. How long after the onset of symptoms? That is uh, six months. Six months. Okay. So I, I did not, I'm not, I was not aware of this, but six months. Okay. So basically I'm, that might be a little longer because this stage 1A, where there is just AVN, and 1B, when the AVN with the reduced height of capital femur. So the stage 1 lasts for, I think, 6 months or 9 months. Stage 1A. So in nutshell, if when the disease of reaches in stage 1B, Elizabeth Town, lateral pillar will get affected. Right? Okay. Go ahead. Which procedure has been shown in this picture? Yeah, so who would like to take this? Chinmay, kya hai? The shelf, acetal, shelf procedure. 
Yeah, so there is a shelf, uh, lateral shelf has been done, right? Okay, here in May, there is complete cut of the iliac and the proximal segment is shifted laterally. It's not PA or DEGA. DEGA is also a kind of uh, a step uh, going through the triradiate as a hinge. Agree, so it's a shelf procedure. Uh, may I continue? Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is the most common complication of medial upper erection of uh, DDH? Coxum agna. Uh, uh, Salil ke saath hoa. Coxum agna is the answer. Coxum agna. Yeah. So, so again, the that branch of medial circumflex can get affected, and coxum agna is the common complication. And to certain extent, we also see subcapital coxa valga, but coxa magna is the most common uh, problem we see. Yeah, next question. This is the likely diagnosis in a three months old infant uh, on the basis of these x rays. Yes, I want uh, Ankit or Vigneshwar or Yakub to answer this question. What do you think it is? The disease. Cafe's disease. Cafe's disease, right. And these patients are very characteristic. Mandibular uh, lesion also. So whenever you see an infant with signs of osteomyelitis, with intact cortex and lot of periosteal reaction, try to check axial skeletal, especially the mandible, clavicle, scapula, fibula and ulna, you know. And if they have swelling there, you should x-ray that. And I was always said in cafes, this is the second pediatric orthopedic surgeon is lucky. And the first is unlucky. We are always confused between uh, an osteomyelitis or cafes. But once we have another joint, uh, another bone involved, then we are pretty sure that this is cafes only. Right. So this was cafes disease. Correct. Next. Which of the following joint is at the lowest risk for septic arthritis in the setting of metaphyseal mm -hmm. osteomyelitis? This is an interesting question. Yakub or Vigneshwaran, can you answer this? Which joint? Yep. Elbow joint. Elbow joint. No. Okay, Ankit. I have also my elbow joint. Okay. So what, what uh, elbow may kya hai? proximal radius jo hota hai? Yes, sir. Uska metaphysis intraarticular hota hai. So, proximal radial osteomyelitis can lead to septic elbow. Okay. Sinam, what is the right answer you have? Knee got? joint. Knee joint. Knee joint, okay. So, which are the other question would be, which are the metaphyses which are intra-articular? Vigneshwaran. So, one is Sir. proximal radius, then? Proximal femoris and the Pro proximal femur. Proximal femur and medial malleolus, the ankle. Ankle joint. So, so these four joints uh, have intra-articular metaphysis, while knee joint metaphysis are extra-articular. Yeah, so this was a tricky question. Good. The next. An 11 years old mm -hmm. boy had septic arthritis shoulder through muscles in the subclavian vein and pulmonary septic embolism. What is the likely organism? Yeah, so yeah, what is the likely diagnosis? Vigneshwaran, Yaku. Community acute MRSA. Yeah, so, so there are two forms of MRSA, right? Yes, sir. Uh, hospital acquired and community acquired. Then hospital acquired, how it is different from community acquired, you know? No, sir. No. Anyone who can uh, think how this hospital acquired MRSAs are different from community acquired? Sir, on the basis of PVL toxin. Yeah. So this community acquired have PVL secreting uh, ones. They are genetically different, and they they can induce this thrombosis in the oh. adjacent vein, and those infective. Emboli can percolate into pulmonary septic embolism. So, community acquired MRSA. And uh, here you have to start not only vancomycin, we also give linezolid and clindamycin because linezolid is bacteriostatic, but it has action on the toxin liberation. 
and clindamycin also reduces the toxin levels. So once it is diagnosed as community acquired MRSA, one has to give vancomycin as well as either clinda or linezolid. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Okay. So next question is uh, MRI picture has been shown here. Which feature of MRI suggests the need of surgical drainage? First is humeral yes. metaphysics. Okay. Uh, or anyone? Exactly. So subperiosteal abscess uh, needs to be drained. If any any abscess that cannot be taken care of by antibiotics, subcutaneous air, brodies is a long-standing disease. So subperiosteal abscess is a correct answer. Now this is a panosseous osteomyelitis. So if you happen to treat this kind of disease. You drain the subperiosteal abscess, make a small window, and use the giggly saw wire. And I have doubts that this child might also have septic elbow below because in the elbow joint also there is some collection. Right. So this is an extensive disease. Yeah. Next question. Last question is calcaneal osteomyelitis has high risk of which of the following as compared to hematogenous osteomyelitis? This is straightforward. So, what is the answer, uh, Vigneshwaran? What do you think? Hemophilus. Hemophilus. Okay. Any anyone else? Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas. So, pseudomonas is the right answer, right, Shina? Yes, sir. Yes. So, pseudomonas infection we see in the foot area, uh, and so you have to consider gram-negative coverage when you have this. Uh, Mainly, we see calcaneal osteomyelitis in patients with civil in insensate foot. And we give gram positive as well as gram negative or something, some set, uh, cephalosporins which have both the coverage. Right, so nice questions, uh, Sheenam and Shalin, and uh, thanks for bringing this answer. Maybe okay. next time we will uh, let you know who has scored highest and uh, at uh, periodically, we'll keep on doing this quiz to refresh your knowledge of uh, last. Maybe after the CP module, we can have a CP quiz. Okay. So thank you very much for your participation. I'm stopping recording. Now we can chat and then we'll leave the meeting. So take care. Next week we have. Uh, uh, Dr. Ratna talking about Botox and uh, thereafter we have Dr. Uh, Professor Dulai from Edmonton who is going to talk about uh, treatment principles of foot in CP. So Dr. Raman Srivastava is fellow in Edmonton and uh, they have shown interest to conduct uh, this academic meeting. So Dr. Dulai Sukhdip, uh, she is a professor she is fellowship coordinator at uh, Edmonton, Canada. And uh, she is going to talk us about, take us through this, uh, their approach of treating foot in cerebral palsy. So that will be very interesting, I think. And Dr. Dhirenbhai is going to talk about crouch. So all uh, nice sessions are coming up. So, so take care and have a good day. Bye, Gaurav. Thanks. That was a nice talk.